All right. Uh, we are now going to start the general principles of hermeneutics. Now, later on, we're going to be looking at the various genres, uh, the genre of, uh, you know, epistle, Old Testament narrative, psalms, uh, poetry, that kind of thing. But uh, these principles will apply to all the genres. Okay, the first principle, study the literary context. Now, at this point, I want to um, have us do some breakout rooms. So let's try this and see if we can do this. Um, and let's see, let's, let's use three rooms. And uh, you will be put with uh, three other people. And uh, four, uh, yeah, three besides yourself. And I'm going to give you a, uh, an assignment in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. One of you may have to look that up. Uh, I'm going to read it from the King James. And it says, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let me read it one more time. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, I want you to uh, look at that and tell me the meaning of this verse. What is the meaning of this verse? That you are the temple of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. If, if anyone de defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Okay, go ahead and um, and uh, we'll break into the rooms, and you'll have ten minutes to discuss this. So go ahead and join the room there. All right, uh, you have looked at this passage in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to 17, and you have seen that by looking at this in literary context, you're able to understand that the temple here is the church and not simply our individual bodies. Now, if you go to chapter 6, there Paul says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So it is true that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but that's not the point that Paul is making in chapter 3. Uh, this is the way that it reads in the King James, and it's, uh, it's not clear what it means if you take this as an isolated verse. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God 
is holy, which temple ye are. Now the NIV makes it clearer. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? Yourselves is plural here. Temple is singular. Many of you together make up the temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So that takes out the ambiguity. When we look at the literary context here, of course, we start with the verse. And then the next larger context is the paragraph. The next larger beyond that are the paragraphs before and after. The next larger par, uh, context is the chapter. And then the book, the whole book. And then the section of the New Testament. So uh, for this verse, the book would be 1 Corinthians. The section of the New Testament would be the epistles of Paul. <coughs> and then the Testament, which would be the New Testament. And then the largest context would be the whole Bible. We cannot overstress the importance of this. It's said that a text without a context is a pretext. You can make anything say anything you want if you ignore the context. For example, the Bible says, Judas went away and hanged himself. It also says, go and do likewise. And it says, what you are about to do, do quickly. So from scripture, you can tell a person to go out and quickly hang himself. We call taking verses out of context like that proof texting. Proof texting. Uh, just using isolated verses to make a case. I thought you might enjoy this little picture. I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. You can make a, a verse say anything you want as long as it's out of context. Now, when I was a child, uh, we had promise boxes. And in fact, at my house in Baguio, I have a little promise box like this that I would normally take to class and, and show my class. Uh, it's usually made in a shape of a loaf of bread like this. And it has a place in it, you see in the top there, for cards. On the cards is written a verse of scripture. So each morning you would take out a card and the verse on it would be your verse for the day. You know, now it's good to think about a particular verse uh, on a day. Uh, the problem is that you have no idea what the context is. The promise box method is not a good way of studying the Bible. And the reason is that you don't have a context for the verse. So if, you're, if your verse for the day was, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, then you would probably be, probably be uh, uh, interpreting that to mean your body. And I would guess that in our churches, even among our ministers, that, the, that if you read this verse, the great majority of them would say it's talking about your body, your physical body. Um, now, sometimes people just open the Bible and take the first verse that they see as God's will for that day. This has been called the Ouija board experience. I, I don't know if you know what a Ouija board is, but it's a, a little board that is supposed to tell you what you ought to be doing. Uh, I recently heard Charles Stanley on television say to do this exact thing. Open the Bible, 
take the first verse that your finger lands on, and that is God's will for you for that day. Now, sometimes God can do that, and He accommodates to our, our poor methods at times. He accommodates to our ignorance, but it's not a good way of doing it. Uh, Klein, Blomberg, and uh, Hubbard uh, give this, this illustration. One of us knew a young man who had decided, uh, who had to decide whether to enlist in the armed forces or go to college. Opening his Bible at random, he saw the passage in Ezekiel that speaks of people coming from Tarshish to Tyre in ships. Although this passage contains no command for anyone to go anywhere in a ship and has nothing to do with becoming part of the armed forces, this young man interpreted the text as a call to join the Navy. Chances are good that he deprived himself of a college education by making a decision he thought was God's will, but perhaps was not. More seriously though, he completely misunderstood what role the Bible should have in the Christian decision-making process. When I was uh, teaching a course on Bible study methodology at the uh, Assemblies of God Theological Seminary in Springfield, Missouri, USA, uh, I was talking about this. And so I decided just to to give an example. So I just opened the Bible at random and I put my finger on a verse. And it was the perfect verse to give as an illustration of why this method is not good. Because the verse my finger landed on was God telling Hosea to go and marry a woman of harlotry. Now, do you really think that that was God's will for me for that day. Well, no, I don't really think so. Okay, uh, it's time for a break. Let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back in 10 minutes. And share. All right. All right. Um, another place where you really need to be uh, conscious of the context is in the book of Job. If you take the teaching of Job's comforters uh, as what the Bible teaches, uh, you're going to come out with some terrible theology. Now, when the Job's comforters talk to him, uh, they say some things that are true, but they say some things that are not. And so you need to take in context what is being said there. Now, I heard of one pastor here in the States uh, who does just that. He teaches that Job's comforters were right. Uh, that's not a normal way of interpreting Job. Uh, so with literary context, uh, context, we need to follow the flow of the author's argument. Paul calls this or fee, calls this tracing the argument. Now, when we use the word argument, we're, we're not saying he's arguing with somebody, but we're, we're saying he's making a case. He's uh, giving evidence for what he believes. And so follow him step by step as he does that. Why does Paul say a particular thing in a particular place? Why here and not someplace else? So uh, we trace the argument. And here we ask, what is the point? 
why is Paul saying this? Uh, he says a lot of things, but what does all mean? What is the point of, of all this? Um, we can only know this as we follow uh, the argument and think his thoughts after him. So this is the immediate literary context. And Fee says, think paragraphs, not verses, not single phrases or single words, but think paragraphs. This is the basic unit of thought, not the verse. So first of all, we deal with the immediate context of the passage, the paragraphs that come right before and right after. And so we, uh, we did that. You did that in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Uh, you saw that this entire section uh, is talking about divisions in the church. And it goes from 110 to 621. Uh, there we see that this is one of several reports that uh, were given to Paul. So he, uh, he heard from people about what was going in uh, on in uh, Corinth. So the next context is the book of 1 Corinthians. We see that what Paul is dealing with here is the basic theme of the entire letter, unity in the church. 1 Corinthians is very orderly in that it deals with one subject matter and then goes to another and then goes to another. And uh, it's very orderly in the way that it does that. Uh, this is especially true of chapter 7 to 14, where Paul is responding to a letter that the Corinthians have written him. And so he says, and now about this, and then, and now about that, and now about this. And you can tell from this cue, now about, or now concerning, that he's switching subjects. So it's like he has his grocery list out, and he's just going to, from one thing to another. Then we look at all of Paul's writings. Here we could compare what Paul says about the final judgment. You know, that, that is what Paul is talking about in chapter 3 there, um, particularly in Romans and 2 Corinthians. Now, a book that is helpful for this is James P. Ware's synopsis of the Pauline letters in Greek and English. And here's the English section where he has... Uh, the judgment seat of Christ. And he brings together the references to uh, being judged on the last day. Now, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 17 is only in a footnote there. And, uh, you know, I would disagree with him. I think this ought to be front and center because this is Paul's greatest uh, treatment of how a Christian is going to be judged on the last day. Uh, for the Gospels, a, uh, a synopsis or parallel version of the Gospels is, uh, is handy in, in you, uh, looking at the context. Uh, the next larger context here for this verse would be the entire uh, New Testament and then the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Now, remember that Paul expects the people in the Corinthian church not to read this letter, but to hear it. They automatically heard the letter in context. So Paul would send the letter to the church and probably the person who took the letter to the church would read it. So he would start at 1-1, and he would go to the end of chapter 16. Uh, they would hear all of the verses 
in its literary context. But not so for us, because we have it written. So we can pick out, pick and choose, pull verses out of one place and another. And so the context doesn't come normally for us. We need to realize that the chapter and verse divisions that we have are not original. It should be noted here that in the Greek manuscripts, there was very little division between words, virtually no division. All the letters were written together with no spaces in between. There is also very little in the way of punctuation, no commas, no periods, no question marks, no exclamation marks. So there, there weren't a chapter or verse divisions in the original manuscripts as, as Paul would have written this. Now, several versions of chapter divisions were introduced beginning in the fourth century. The divisions that we use today for the chapters was written by Stephen Langdon at the beginning of the 13th century. Uh, the first Greek New Testament with verses uh, divided out uh, was in 1551, a system developed by Robert Stephanus. And uh, it is said that Stephanus did the verse divisions on a trip between uh, Paris and Lyon. And some people have, uh, you know, if they, especially if they disagree with the verse division, would say, well, no wonder he was on his horse. He was traveling from Paris to Lyon on his horse doing verse divisions. Well, probably not. Probably what that means is that in the inns, in the evening, when he wasn't traveling, that he did the ver uh, verse divisions then. So context is extremely important in understanding the meaning of a passage. Fee and Stewart say literary context is the crucial task in exegesis. And Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard say an interpretation is more likely to be correct, the correct one, when it explains the passage in a way that is consistent with the theme of the section in which the passage occurs. Then the likely interpretation shows how that section contributes to the overall progress of the book. All right, uh, literary context. Do you have questions or comments here? Do we all understand literary context? I think if we, to me, if I look at, um, closely to the literary context and see how, how, how the structure goes, then it tells me it's not, uh, it's not uh, God's word and uh, finding the truth and everything like that. It's not just read one line and that's it. Mm -hmm. Finding out your, your own brain and your own mind. Because as we, we end up, as, a, as, you, as we see, the, as I see the list, the list it ends up of studying the whole Bible. Then you, more like you find the thing. My point is that, uh, what do you call it? God's word is, it's, it's not just reading. It's more than a reading. It's more, if you, if you, now we're looking at the Corinthians chapter that we used, mm -hmm. that's, because that's as you explain and uh, put it on the screen, you know, from you can study the scripture, even if it's two lines, we still can read that, that formation. And then that gives us a, a what do you call it? A uh, whole, uh, whole truth of what the, the 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 writer was 
talking about. Mm -hmm. And I thank yeah. you for the for the explanation and the clarification of the matter. Thanks. All right. How many of us have heard sermons of one or two lines uh, taken out of context? You know, I know we all have. And um, yes, we need to avoid that. We need to make sure that we truly understand what that verse is saying in context. All right, any other questions or comments here? All Sir, right, um, yes, uh-huh. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, actually, according to the Fian Stewart, um, the literary context is very crucial. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just wondering, what is the standard um, between the, the, the uh, literary context and application? Because um, actually, we are doing uh, our, uh, like, for example, meditation, and then we are preaching uh, sometimes to the congregations, but uh, using uh, several texts, we have to give uh, application. Right. Uh, so yeah, well, there is a I... difference between literary context and application. The literary context helps you understand the meaning of the passage. Okay, that is the first step. Yes. You need to understand what that passage means. So that is where literary context comes in. Once you do that, then you can do the application. So they're, they're really separate steps. We, we, we exegete the, the uh, passage, and then we exegete our culture, our people, what are our people in our church facing, and then we see how this passage relates to where they are. So, um, so we first of all exegete the text and then we apply that text to the people that we're speaking to. So d does that help? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, okay, good. You know, I, I once heard a record, this was in the days of vinyl recordings. Uh, and the president of the United States was Lyndon Johnson many years ago. And somebody took things that he had said uh, in his speeches and they put them in different contexts. So they would say, and President Johnson, what about this? And they would give his answer. And it was hilarious. It was, it was funny. funny because it, uh, it was totally out of context. So you can make him say anything you, want, you wanted. And that's unfortunately what we do with Paul or Mark or uh, John the Revelator or whoever, which we mustn't do. Okay, uh, let us go on to study the historical context. We need to make a special effort to understand the historical context of the biblical writers because we're separated from them uh, by uh, thousands of years in time, thousands of kilometers in distance, a huge uh, distance in cultural understanding. So we cannot read the Bible, uh, the biblical documents, as if they were written to the 21st century Asia or America or the islands or Europe. Uh, we have to understand their context. Now, I was on Facebook within the past week and um, one man came on here and I, he said something, I wanna read it to you. And one of my responses to it was, I can't wait to, to uh, share this conversation with my hermeneutics class. He said, honestly, 
what good does it to know about the writers of Scripture or the culture of the time it was written? We have been led astray in doing so. Focusing on the writers and or the culture diminishes the author, capital A, and his authority and renders his word culture and time bound, humanizing it and demeaning its holy and authoritative content. All we need to know is that the Bible is God's holy word. He is the author, and we are to respect, honor, and submit to it. So he's saying, don't worry about the historical cultural context, because his, uh, his idea of inspiration is that of dictation, that God dictated the words to the biblical writers, and they were like tape recorders or digital recorders or uh, stenographers, the people who write down what people say. So they were like machines, according to this man. And so uh, the culture, according to him, doesn't matter at all. The, uh, the author doesn't matter at all because the authors of scripture were not authors, he says. God was the author and they were writers. They were, they took down the dictation as God spoke it. So now all we have to do is go back and read it and it will be perfectly clear to us, according to him, as to what it means. Unfortunately, that isn't true. And uh, we are going to see why here. Uh, an example, Jesus is Lord. When the New Testament says Jesus is Lord, we take it as a purely religious statement. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is the one we pray to, praise, and serve. He's in control of everything. But what would that phrase mean to a first century Greek or Roman or Jew? Paul calls Jesus Savior and Lord. The message of Jesus is called good news, the evangel. But we need to realize, uh, as we mentioned before, that these words have deeply political meanings in the first century. Caesar was called Savior and Lord. When Christians proclaim Jesus is Lord, Curios Jesus, they were giving a challenge to the Romans who said, Curios uh, Caesar. Jesus is Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, then Caesar is not. For the Jew, the word kurios, Lord, was the word that the Septuagint used for the name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh. Especially for Jews, that has had huge ramifications for using this title for Jesus. If we're going to be able to translate the meanings of the first century AD or the fifth century BC into an equivalent meaning for the 21st century, we have to know what it meant to the original audience. Another example, uh, when John in Revelation writes to the church in Sardis, he tells them to wake up. He may have been drawing on their history. The history of the city of Sardis gives us an excellent example of what was happening in the church at Sardis. The original city of Sardis was built upon 
what was believed to be impregnable cliffs. Look at this, at this picture. Look way up at the top. That is where the city of Sardis uh, was in biblical times. Later it grew and was located in the valley at the foot of the cliffs. In 549 BC, Cyrus, the king of Persia, came against Cressus, king of Lydia, whose capital was Sardis. Cy uh, Cyrus knew he couldn't advance to the west until Sardis, which was at the top of the cliff, was taken. So he offered a reward to anyone who could find a way to get up the cliffs and take the city. One soldier by the name of uh, Hier Hieroides uh, was studying the situation when he saw a soldier of Sardis drop his helmet over the wall. The soldier went down over the wall, went down the cliff and retrieved his helmet and went back up. And the soldier uh, for the Persians saw how he did it. And he and other soldiers went that same way going up that sheer cliff. And when they got to the top, they found the city completely unguarded. They were able to go in and take the city because they were not watchful. And history repeated itself. 313 years later, Antiochus came against Sardis and captured it in the same way when the soldiers came up over the unguarded wall. How perfectly that described the situation at Sardis. It wasn't on guard. It was being lulled to sleep. And when we try to determine the meaning of a passage, we must take into account the mindset of the people in that culture. Uh, the first century had an orientation of honor and shame that's much closer to the present day Asian uh, way of thinking than it is to the uh, Western way of thinking. Uh, the Westerners tend to be quite individualistic uh, and don't care as much what people think about them as generally Asians do. So uh, to humiliate a person in public in Asia is just about the worst thing you can do. Um, in America, it's not quite so bad. In fact, they have what they call roasts, have a banquet, and they'll roast one person there that they really honor, but they make jokes about him and put him down and everybody laughs, even the person that's being put down. I don't think that would happen in Asia probably uh, because we're too sensitive uh, along those lines. Uh, let me give you another example. Study of the historical cultural context of the Mosaic covenant. The covenant that God made with Moses and the children of Israel was not a totally new form of, of agreement. When you compare the Sinai covenant with the treaties of the ancient Near East, you will see that there are many similarities. Now, those of you who are in New Testament uh, introduction will have, have heard this early on in the course. Um, the covenant at Sinai was not between two equals. It was between a, uh, a superior and an inferior. It was between God and Israel. And this very closely parallels a kind of treaty in the Old Testament times called a suzerain vassal treaty. Suzerain was a conquering nation. The vassal 
was the conquered nation. The conquering nation would make a treaty with the conquered nation and it would give the treaty. It wouldn't negotiate with the conquered nation. It would say, here it is. Uh, this is my, what I will do. This is what you will do. And there was no negotiation. Very similar to that was the covenant between God and the Israelites. God didn't negotiate with the Israelites and say, well, what do you think we ought to do here? God gave his covenant, and it was the responsibility of the Israelites to obey it. There were two kinds of treaties in those days. There were parity treaties, treaties between equals, and there were suzerain vassal treaties, the superior and the inferior. Uh, the suzerain vassal treaty had several components in it, a preamble, the historical prologue, what led up to this, the treaty stipulations, uh, general clauses, and then specific st uh, stipulations, divine witnesses or guarantors. They would call on the gods to uh, guarantee and witness what they were doing, and maledictions or curses for breaking the covenant, benedictions or blessings for keeping the covenant. And some examples of this, we won't go into, um, into this in any depth, is in uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19 and 20. We see that most of these elements are here. And then in Joshua 24 as well, most of the elements are there. So the covenant between God and Israel was very similar to the covenant between a conquering nation and a, uh, a conquered nation. So there is a pattern here that, uh, that we see as the background for God's covenant with Israel. Let me give another example. In the creation account, how can knowing the historical cultural background help us with this? Uh, as we study this passage, the, the account of creation, uh, we see some, uh, a very interesting thing. We would think that uh, God would first create the sun, moon, and stars, and only then would the creation of light be possible. But we see, in fact, that the very opposite is the case. Light is created first, and not until the fourth day is the sun, moon, and stars created. And when they are, the text says that, uh, that they are lamps, that God hang lamps in the firmament. It's the same word that is used for the lamps that were used in the tabernacle. Um, now, this is not a slip of the pen on the part of, uh, of Moses as he writes this. Even he would not be so scientifically ignorant as to think that the sun, moon, and stars <clears throat> are not the earth's source of light. No, there must have been some purpose in this order. What is this light? without sun, moon, or stars. What is this to indicate to us? In the ancient world, they believed in astrology, and they put stock in horoscopes, uh, very much in the same way that some people do today. They believed that the sun, moon, and stars determined the fate of people on earth. But to this world, whose thinking was and is saturated through and through with astrology, the biblical account of creation 
comes proclaiming the stars have no power, only functions. They divide the light from the darkness and give us a basis of recording time, and that is all. One person said, the stars in no way create light, but they are mere, merely intermediary, intermediary bearers of a light which existed without them and before them. The light comes from God, not from the heavenly bodies. And by the way, the Bible, looking at the end of time, says that in that day, again, there will be no sun, for God himself will be the source of light, something very similar to Genesis 1. Now, what does all this mean? It means that ultimately, <clears throat> we are not in the hands of uncontrolled cosmic forces. Our lives are not dominated by stars or chance or fate. Yes, there are spiritual enemies. There are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and the arch enemy Satan, but these are defeated enemies and they have nothing to do with the stars. God is in control. He has not uh, designated control of our world to lesser beings. He himself controls our world and our destinies. That means that he is present with us and in control of our situation. Nothing we will ever encounter is beyond his power, whether it's sickness or worry, destitution, hunger, frustration, persecution, nothing is out of God's control. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul gives that great passage telling of all the forces that can't separate us from the love of God. In his list, he mentions height and depth, and these are probably astrological powers. Paul says explicitly what Genesis 1 implies. The astrological powers, and he adds death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, and anything, anything else in all creation, none of that will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm -hmm. The love of God is the most powerful force in the universe. Satan and sin are defeated powers. God won the ultimate victory over them in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the account of creation in Genesis was not written in scientific language. You know, science has no way of getting back to the beginning of beginnings when the, uni uh, when the universe with its matter and energy was brought into being. This account in Genesis is not modern. It doesn't use modern scientific methods. What is it then? Is it an adaptation of legends and myths of ancient man um, to the Hebrew mind? Would ancient man of surrounding cultures see his own stories in the creation of heaven and earth reflected in the Genesis account? If there is a contrast between Genesis and modern science, there is just as much a contrast between Genesis and the other creation of counts of the ancient Near East. The Babylonian Genesis depicts a war between two groups of ancient gods. The big loser, the goddess uh, Tiamat, was cut up and from her the earth and sky were formed. Mankind 
was formed from one of her warrior monsters called Kengu. Thus man and nature were made from curse-ridden material. They were inherently evil. Now this is according to the Babylonian Genesis account. No doubt those men of old conceived such hideous tales trying to make sense of the world that they saw about them. When injustice was seen, an answer for it lay close at hand. The stuff of the world is evil, so it has to be. Even more so, when they saw evil in their own hearts, they had a ready answer. This is the way it must be. After all, the world is inherently evil. We have no choice. Evil is written into our chromosomes. And how can we be responsible for our chromosomes? Don't you know that we were made from a monster and the spirit of Kingu still lurks in our hearts? Now, this is the cultural background of the Genesis account of creation. In contrast to such uh, gory and tragic stories, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made it out of nothing. Mankind and the world are not inherently evil. Yes, they are corrupted, but not inherently evil. The inherently evil is not redeemable, but the corrupted is. Evil is in our world as an intruder. An invader that never should have been there. God created the world and he said, it is good. And that goodness is basic to creation. No, we can't make the excuse that we are made from evil material. We are a creation that God called into being by his own choice and because of his own love. And we are responsible to him. Our sin is of our own choice and we must bear the responsibility for our own choices. Paul tells us that in Romans 8, not only will we be redeemed, but all creation will be redeemed when we are. Redemption is cosmic. The fall will be reversed and creation that is now groaning as a woman in childbirth uh, will be set free. So every aspect of culture needs to be considered. Uh, the societal structures of uh, marriage and family, economic structures, political structures, the geography and climate, the modes of transportation, and religious views. The more we know about these, the better we can understand what the original audience could and could not have understood by the words that are written. Okay, okay. Uh, this has been a monologue uh, so far for which I apologize. Uh, it's been one way me talking to you. Uh, our time is up, but I would like uh, at the beginning next time for you to give your input, ask your questions about what we've been talking about, and we will go from there. All right. God bless you. Have a good weekend, and we will see you on Wednesday. God bless you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.